It's a beautiful day for a beautiful day. We've got Megan Murphy in health. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here, Tiff. As I said, there's not many people I get up anymore now that I'm not doing radio before 8 a.m. So that's how much I love you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's nice to be with all of you this morning. And uh, thank you to the chamber team and to Tiffany for asking me to speak. But it's kind of ironic that I've been asked to speak to you wonderful business leaders and entrepreneurs because um, I've just wrapped up a theatrical production that um, is a show I co-created with Kate Sir, who's a musician. And uh, it's called the Veranda Society. We just did a, a few weeks run at um, Fourth Line Theater in Millbrook. And so now we've had closing night, struck the site, the whole site, and now I'm gainfully unemployed once again. So yay, yay. That's the joy of being an artist and an entrepreneur. So hip, hip, hooray for that. It's the joy and the heart palpitations that come with my chosen profession. <laughs> but I consider myself very lucky because I get to tell stories for a living and through film or acting or on the radio or I help businesses tell their stories, not for profits, whether it's mine or someone else's story. I get to keek into the human experience and then hold it up for observation. And in so doing, I hope to understand this shared human existence just a little bit more. Because stories are important. Everything begins with a story. Stories shape us, and whether the story is true or lie, whether it's a story told to us by someone else or a story we tell ourselves to help make sense of a situation. Stories are being written all the time. Even as we sit here right now, another paragraph is being drafted and we all have interesting stories to tell. There's a Buddhist philosophy that says the greatest gift you can give someone is to listen them into existence. So thank you for allowing me to share some of my story today. So I was born and raised in Peterborough, and then I moved to Toronto to attend York University, and I majored in theater and minored in international relations, thinking I could save the world through art. Any day now. Any day. And since then, I started a theater company. I worked as an actor. I went back to school for documentary film. I've worked in the not-for-profit world. I built houses in Southeast Asia. I studied improv with Second City. I fell backward into the world of radio where I co-hosted a morning show for 12 years. And the only common theme amongst all of these iterations of life is that virtually none of it went according to plan. Because most of the things that have happened in my life happened because something else did not work out. Because something I wanted did not come to fruition or a giant wrench got thrown into my plans. And I'd like to think that I have been a successful failure for many years. And with a little bit of work, a little dedication, you too can be a successful failure. Let's talk about how failing can be some of the best things that might happen to you. Because my life changed the moment that it fell apart. It was my 35th birthday and I ended my engagement to my fiance and I gave him back his ring and I packed up my little hatchback with all my worldly belongings. And once again, for the umpteenth time in my life, I moved back to Peterborough to my childhood home, to the house that I'd grown up in, except for one disconcerting fact both of my parents were dead. So on my 35th birthday, I put on my mom's oversized pink pajamas. They had sheep jumping fences on the front and I ordered a pizza and I had a bottle of wine in the other hand and I rode the stair glide up to bed, watched some cheesy movies and wiped tears from my eyes and grease from my chin. And I thought to myself like this, this has gotta be a rock bottom. And if this wasn't my life, this would be a great scene in a movie. But my sisters and I started to clean out things from my parents' house. And in one box of old books, I found a journal that my dad had kept when he was 26 year old, years old. And he'd been sort of lost at this point in his life and he didn't know what to do next. And so he took his bicycle and a journal and he went back to Ireland, the home of our ancestors. And he cycled his way back to his, his roots. And he told us about the journey, but he had long thought that he had lost the journal in a fire. My parents' house burned down in the seventies, but I found it. And I also found his 1973 rusted out red steel Peugeot hanging from the rafters of the garage. And so I took it down and I took his bike, his journal and a film crew, and I went back to Ireland to retrace his steps. I felt like it was a sign. I made a documentary and I called it Murphy's Law. And so when I thought that my life was at rock bottom, it was really just beginning again. And I've had the privilege of touring my film through different parts of Canada and back in Ireland, and it's taken on a life of its own. And in having the opportunity to share my story, it then gave other people the opportunity to share theirs. And it's been powerful because stories bring people together and we can heal each other with our stories. We can inspire each other. We can make each other feel a little less alone when we share. So the one thing that often stands in our way and prevents us from sharing that story or speaking up, it's just fear. 
fear of failure, fear of people looking at us, fear of looking stupid. But I think of fear kind of like an airport. It's a necessary evil. Nobody likes the airport. It's stuffy. It's overpriced. Once you're in, you can't leave. People pat you down. They look in my purse. It's just a holding zone between your real life and the next destination. So nobody packs your bag with the intention of staying at the airport. And fear is the same way. I think fear should inform us, but then give us a pat down at security, you know? But we can't stay there. We have to have the courage to walk down the ramp and get on the plane and see what's coming next. And as for the fear of looking stupid, I think we just need to embrace that. One of the best things my dad ever taught me was to not take myself so seriously. He said, no one can make fun of you if you're the first to find yourself hilarious. I guess I'm my own best audience. But I kind of now look forward to these moments when I fall on my face because they make for way better stories. And when I was working on the radio, my co-host and I created a whole bit called Public Humiliations with Megan P. Murphy because I embarrass myself so frequently that we can actually create material out of it. And it made me take myself less seriously. Because when you put yourself out there and you share your ideas, yes, it is scary, but the worst that's gonna happen is that it won't work. And that's it. And inevitably, you'll turn a corner. And inevitably, you'll end up with a more entertaining story and a more resilient and fulfilling life. So in fact, if, if fear is like an airport, I have a great and embarrassing airport story for you. So it was a few years ago, uh, my film was playing at a festival in Thunder Bay. And they offered to fly me up there and I thought, well, I have made it now. I'm going to the booming metropolis of Thunder Bay to watch my film. This is exciting. I always overpack. And this time I was like, no, I am a director and I'm going to pack ahead of time. And it's going to be, I'm going to have carry on and I'm going to get to the airport on time. So I got there with my little roll up. I had a wrap. I am ready to go. All the seats are taken. So I find a little spot on a, a like an air compressor, air conditioner thing over by the window. I sit down, I'm just like, I am killing it. I am killing life, eating my rep. They call me up from the gate. I'm like, Megan Murphy, would you please come to the gate? And I always think I've done something wrong. It's a Catholic schoolgirl in me. I'm like, oh God, what did I do? So I get up quickly and <laughs> the back pocket of my jeans caught on this air compressor and ripped, ripped off. So my, my bomb was exposed. <laughs> so I <laughs> wrap suitcase, exposed bum cheek, and I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So I got rid of the wrap, put my hand on my bum, walked up to the gate, very embarrassed, sweating, red face, and they just wanted to, you know, change my seat, give me a new boarding pass. I thought, okay, great, I just, I, thank you very much. And I turn around and sitting right behind me is Mr. Chris Hadfield. <laughs> he was heading to Thunder Bay on the same flight to uh, do a talk at the university. And so I looked at him, he looked at me and I said, I am so sorry. I just mooned an astronaut. <laughs> and then I went and changed my pants and I asked him for a photo. And it was a way better flight than had I not ripped my pants. <laughs> I had material for days on the radio. I see, I've been an actor for 20 years in plays and commercials and TV shows, and I've had some of the most embarrassing roles ever. But more often than not, being an actor means you don't get the part. You audition and never hear back. So rejection is my jam. And I actually think that's been a blessing because it's made me more resilient and I'm not afraid to share my ideas or new things because I'm so used to things not working out that you go, okay, well, I guess that wasn't meant to be. Or I need to be more creative or I need to come at it from another angle. Or maybe that was someone else's. And the sooner I started to befriend failure, the more success I began to find. And all this successful failing has also taught me to be a good friend to myself again because we have the power to be incredible friends to one another. And we have the power to be incredibly unkind to each other as well and to do terrible damage. And we have choices about which of those roads we wanna take, but the most important relationship we are ever gonna have is the relationship that we have with ourselves. And I'm always busy. I have this tragic flaw where I think that I can jam more things into any given day than is humanly possible. So when I was working in Toronto, I was working for the Multiple Sclerosis Society. I was at this big glass tower at the corner of Bloor and Church in Toronto. And it was my lunch break and I thought, okay, well, I can check off 42 things on my lunch break. I can get it all done. And as I was rushing back to get back to work, I the whole glass building, I noticed this woman walking towards me, a coworker, someone I liked, just a quick recognition in my busyness. And so I smiled, waved and held the door for her. And then I realized that I had seen my own reflection 
and I had noticed myself as a friend and I waved at myself and held the door for myself. <laughs> and my first instinct was like mortification. And then I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But when I wasn't paying attention, I actually recognized myself as my own friend. And sometimes when we're too hard on ourselves, we're not kind enough to ourselves. And so I decided after, when I was in Ireland that I was gonna make up with myself. And I decided that I was gonna be my own best friend because the only person I'm with 24 hours a day for the rest of my life is myself. And so I decided it was time to be kinder and more forgiving and not so hard on myself, to find myself amusing, to focus on my strengths and to protect myself from people who don't champion me. Because no matter where you go, there you are. And I wanna have a blissful life with myself. And so I want that for you too. So thank you so much for having me here today. Be extra kind to yourselves and to each other. Share your story and listen to the stories of others. And I hope you have a wonderful life full of delightful failures that lead you exactly to the path you're meant to be on. Thanks for listening me into existence this morning and get out there now and just fail your face off. Well done. That's Thanks awesome. for having me. Uncle Meg Murphy, we laughed, we cried, we had all the emotions. <laughs> oh my God. Thanks for having me. Um, when you were talking, it reminded me of a story that you told me one time when you were a, a surly teenager and your parents forced you to change and go to this party. Do you, can you tell that story? Yeah, I, I sure can. <laughs> I was about 15 and we were going to a great aunt's uh, 80th birthday party in Toronto and I came down and grunge style was in so I had like these ripped jeans oversized stuff and I looked ridiculous and my parents said no you are not wearing that to Aunt Mamie's party go put on the floral skirt come back down and so fine I did it and then I huffed and I sat in the back of our station wagon punishing everyone the entire way to Toronto and uh, they're just so blessed to have me in their presence <laughs> and we get to the party and I'm still like punishing everybody for ruining my life and my individuality. And my dad came over to me, put his arm around me and he said, do you see this room? You are the least interesting person in this room. That there are people here who have fought in wars. They have had jobs. They've had sex. They voted all things you have never done. So why don't you stop feeling sorry for yourself and walk around mm -hmm. this room and you learn something. Okay, good talk. <laughs> and he's okay. right. And I think it's been a real life lesson for me because often I just think it's the neatest thing to be the least interesting person in the room. I love it. What was your dad's name, Megan? Marty Murphy. Yeah, he was a, he was a criminal lawyer in town. Oh, cool. Murphy's yeah. Law. Murphy's law. Murphy's law. I get it now. Yeah, it works. It works on more than one level. It does. <laughs> the Murphy's law, you know, when you have a day and everything goes wrong and they call it Murphy's law. Yeah. 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 Whatever. That's yeah. in the movie too. Can I just uh, um, also congratulate you on Saturday's ceremony for the your induction into the Walk of Fame. Thank you. Joining joining your dad Marty yeah. uh, were you able to convince them to put your stone beside his not yet but uh okay. my my stone is in and now I'm, it looks out it's beautiful yeah. but we'll sneak down some night and move it and yes it i also am, i'm joining you mr Stu harrison so we should go down and have a little tipple yeah. <laughs> <I'll Bones>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'll let somebody else jump in when did they let you know that you were awarded a, a stone in the pathway meg Maybe like uh, in sometime in July. Awesome. Yeah. What did you did somebody have to submit for you? Do you know kind of how it went down? Yeah, I was nominated and then there were letters of reference and stuff. And Beth McMaster was the nominator. So I think my voice went about eight octaves high. And I went, what are you saying? What? No! <laughs> and then, um, I called Beth and I was like, you, you're an idiot. And I cried. And <laughs> I, I was really very honored, very honored. What a, an esteemed, esteemed group to be amongst yeah you deserve it it's amazing it was so so good to see you we appreciate it it's just funny I, I love this town I really love my hometown and I um 
it feels really humbling because I just something about this place keeps pulling me back and something about the people here. It's just, I don't know, there's something special here and I feel like I'm a part of it. And I, I said on the weekend, um, and after my parents died and I, I was living in Toronto when my mom died and I felt this sense of homelessness, like I don't know where I belong anymore and I don't know who I belong to anymore. And when I came back to Peterborough, I was so embraced by the community and I, it kind of reminded me of who I am and what I'm about and what's important. And, um, and I, I, I guess I want to make sure that no one else ever feels homeless in our hometown. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. I just saw Ashley commented. She's tried to leave twice. <laughs> <laughs> Bro always pulls you back. I know it like, does. From hug because they don't, it doesn't judge when you come crawling back. It's so true. There's something in the water. I tell you. I agree. I've been, my family's tried to pull me a couple times back to Hamilton, but there's no, there's, yeah. no, there's no way. I just can't live in that stinky city. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot to be desired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I have two questions for you, Meg Murphy. My first question is, was one of your family members really the chair of our board? Yeah, my Aunt Sharon. She was the first female chair of the board at the chamber. The first female chair of the board. Yeah, baby. That yeah. is neat. Does yeah. she tell you any stories about that? Uh, she in, she enjoyed her tenure there. And then she, I remember, I think I might have told this story that she, um, she was given for Peterborough Day at the Blue Jays game. So this would have been in the early 90s. She was given the opportunity to throw out the first pitch on behalf of Peterborough and the Chamber of Commerce. But my grandfather, her dad, um, Grandpa Eddie, Eddie Murphy, <laughs> the first Eddie Murphy, he um, used to be a professional baseball player. And so she gifted him the opportunity and he was about 80. And uh, so he went and threw out the first pitch and our whole family was there we were, yeah, Grandpa Eddie, for Peterborough Day. So it was a big thing for the Chamber and for Peterborough and for my family of like, yay, Grandpa Eddie. <laughs> Oh, Peter Road Day. Let's bring it. Yeah, there used to be a Peter Road Day. That's what you need. I know. My next question for you, Meg, is what's next for you? Oh, God, Steph. Oh, God. I, can be good. I don't know. <laughs> um, that's always the funny part of being an entrepreneur and being an artist is I worked for, you know, it must have been around last February or March when Kim Blackwell called and said, would you and Kate consider writing a show? So then you bust your butt and I wrote an 80 minute show and then uh, we rehearsed the show. We put the show on, the show is done and you go, oh God, now what? <laughs> and so now I have to think again about, you know, we might need you, Phil, because marketing ain't my jam. And so now you have this product and I don't know how to market it. So we might have to do a little something here. Um, yeah, so maybe try to market the Veranda Society to tour to regional theaters. Um, I'm doing more writing. So I just wrote another article for Reader's Digest. So every uh, every couple months, check the back of your toilet. There's a little article in there. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I, I guess just I'm going to be doing the Chamber Excellence Awards, coming up with some ideas. So I, I'm kind of, um, I do a lot of different things. I'm going to write a book. I need to just figure out how to get it published beforehand. <laughs> and yeah, I created a little job title for myself called an ideation consultant. So companies can hire me when they're stuck on ideas on how to come up with something. Ideas are my jam. So I like to work for companies and often come up with video ideas for them in uh, telling stories ideas. So we did a project for, um, uh, for Parn about um, awareness and compassion and community. And we did a project for, um, well, for it was a joint project around, um, for the public health unit, the city of Peterborough, for Literacy Ontario, they were joint task force to talk about um, uh, underemployment and um, what we can do about that. So that we started as uh, COVID was happening. So we had to kind of reshift and rejig it. Stu is involved as well in that. And uh, so, yeah, so now we're just, I do things like that. Every week is a new jam. <laughs> your um, your so approach to the United Way was also really special as well, the way you helped to tell that story. And it was just completely different than anyone had ever done before. So oh, thank that's, you. Your, that's your skill. Is that me? Who's oh, gotta go. 
<laughs> Sorry, take care, everyone. All the best. <laughs> Actually, when I did the United Way, I was so scared because I felt like such an imposter. And I felt like I don't, I'm not an anyone. And I'm, I don't know people with money. I'm an artist. And I don't know, I am not good at asking for money. I, what is my superpower that I can sort of bring to this? And the only thing I could think of is I really like people and I collect people and I'm obsessed with stories. And so I'm like, maybe I can just tell stories and tell people's stories in a way that might inspire folks to get involved. But I remember saying to Jim Russell, like, oh man, you should get someone else to go into those meetings to ask for money because I feel so bad. And by the end, I'm like, never mind, I'll write the check. It's okay. I, I feel bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I am not a fundraiser, but I, I, I enjoyed partnering with people who do fundraise. <laughs> It's well, they so didn't. Uh, they didn't ask you for what you don't know. They asked you for what you know, right? right so right. And, and you knocked yeah. it out of the park. Thank you, my friend. It's interesting that you said that you're not a fundraiser because I don't. United Way isn't the only fundraising thing that you have spearheaded. Wasn't there another another project, another organization that you were? Um, yeah, I've done some other ones. I, now we're doing. Oh, we're doing another Kortha Food Share drive. Uh, but see, that's good because then I don't have to ask for money. I'm just asking for canned goods and I'm not asking for too much. I'm just asking you to put it on your porch. So it's okay. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. It's just spaghetti sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so Meg, you mentioned that you've written for uh, Reader's Digest. I, of course, have read a few of those articles. The Jube Jube one stands out, like really, really spoke to me um, when that one came out. But how long have you been writing for Reader's Digest? Um, Probably about five or six years now. So they, it's kind of fun because they will, um, they'll message me when they need like a pitch of some kind. So I'm totally new and a neophyte in the writing world. And if I'm like, is this, okay, this is how this works. You just like throw them a bunch of ideas. And if they like one, they, you write it. So I just throw them a bunch of stuff. And sometimes I'll just send them a blog and go like, do you like this? And then they'll buy it and I have to edit it down and, you know, from 2000 words to 500 or something. <laughs> so it makes you less precious with your work too, because you have to get to the essence quick. Wow, really interesting to hear how it kind of works on the other side of that. Yeah, it's kind of fun. One last question for you. Yeah. Is there anything that you haven't tried that's on your list to try? What's on Meg Murphy's bucket list? Oh God. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good question. Mm hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's so weird because I, I think um, I know the word dilettante has a negative connotation to it. it. A dilettante is, you know, someone who is an amateur, particularly in the arts, but kind of considers themselves a bit of a, an expert. But I think I'm kind of a life dilettante. <laughs> like, I like to just try and try new things and see where my mind wants to go next. And so this over COVID, I was feeling really badly about having no skills in the medical world and you know when you think of maslow's hierarchy of needs it's like being an artist is very important but it's at the top and right now we're all at the bottom and we're all like how do we stay safe and how do we make sure we're taken care of and how do we you know blah 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 blah, blah. <clears throat> and so i started taking medical courses through mcmaster university because <laughs> i was like well maybe maybe i'll be a doctor so i started <laughs> taking med school courses which was really hard, but it was really great. And then I started thinking like, okay, wait, I don't know that I want the minutia of being a doctor, but I do want to make some changes in our medical system. So can I take, I'm taking this healthcare certificate through McMaster to then think, can I then in do talks or inspire med students in like their fourth year to be better listeners and better navigators. So I also took a patient navigation course this past, winter through York. So the idea being like, how do you help people navigate the system? Because it's frightening. And um, I've got a lot of, we've had a lot of illness in our family. And so I've been able to navigate. And so I'm trying to think of like, how can I make something that doesn't exist yet? And blah, blah, blah. blah. So I do that. So I don't know what I want to try next. I don't know. <laughs> You're just amazing. It's amazing. Who does that? Like, <laughs> I just, you blow me away. Like you just say you're inspiring. I feel like we don't, I don't do enough. <laughs> no, I, but my sisters laugh at me because they're like, are any of the things you're doing ever going to pay your mortgage? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. 
Maybe. <laughs> Meg Murphy essence. I want to know. I just want to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Meg, keep spreading joy. I don't know if you really realize the impact that you have on the people that you touch and through the stories that you tell and, and even, you know, the campaign that you ran with United Way, like Stu said, with those videos. And, and, and I'll never forget being at Showplace when they, when they launched the campaign and that guy's video came on and it was just so powerful and emotional. Yeah. Anyway, you're, you're, you're marvelous. The marvelous oh. Megan Murphy. Thank you, you are wonderful. You're good for my ego. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your hype gal. It's all good. Anybody else needs a pep talk? Give me a call. Yes, yeah, true. Thank you, everyone. Steph, thank you so much for joining us today. Megan Murphy, it's been an honor. You're a gem. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Enjoy your coffee.